runs on yeah. Right then, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to Poly 100, segment the second. Uh, as you know, I'm Christopher May. I have, uh, this is the fourth year I've been convening this course, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Richard Johnson, who's going to do the second segment of this course. Uh, we're really lucky to have Richard do these lectures, and indeed we're always lucky to have our esteemed colleagues do these lectures because we're all very busy. Uh, one of the things that Richard's been busy doing is he's just written a new book uh, called uh, The End of the Second Reconstruction, which is all about American politics. But more importantly, if you like what Richard's doing over the next uh, eight, no, seven lectures, seven lectures, if you like what Richard's doing over the next seven lectures, he also has a very popular second year course called Government and Politics in the United States. So please feel free to sign up for that. Um, Richard's going to take you through this segment, and then I'll be back in about seven lectures' time to introduce you to your next lecturer. As I said, Richard knows his stuff. Listen carefully. You're going to find out a lot of very useful and helpful things. I shall now pass over to Richard. Thank you, Chris. And thank you all. Um, today's lecture marks a shift in Poly 100 from a discussion about the principles of liberal democracy to a discussion about its practice. And using the United States and the United Kingdom as comparative cases, this section of the course begins with an analysis about the frameworks and uh, sort of blueprint of uh, liberal democracy constitutions. Then we move into a discussion next week about the democratic engines of uh, liberal democracies, that is, uh, elected legislatures and elected uh, executives. And then we move on in the week after that to talk about some of the constraints on those majoritarian institutions, uh, what we might call veto players or checks on national democracy. Uh, so we're going to look at judiciaries, and we're also going to look at stratified uh, power structures, looking at federalism and devolution and how some power gets taken out of the national center and relocated into other institutional structures. And then in the final week, we're going to talk about the ways in which citizens make demands on those institutions. So this is where the voters come in, and we're going to talk about political parties and why people vote for political parties and how political parties function. And then at the end of the course, we're going to talk about uh, what I call the sort of politics of citizenship, immigration, and belonging. So this is where we get the discussion about immigration and race, populism, uh, accountability through uh, elites, uh, and so on. So that's how uh, it's going to pan out. So today, we're going to talk about uh, constitutions. And I first want us to talk about the role that constitutions fill in democratic societies. So at their most fundamental level, constitutions set out the rules of the political game. Constitutions tell us what political institutions exist, how they should be configured, how they should interact with each other, how the members of those institutions get chosen, how they get removed, uh, what are the protocols and procedures of how they should uh, organize themselves, and so on. Now, political scientists believe that one of the core features of a constitution is that a constitution should be self-enforcing. That is to say that members of the relevant political community broadly agree with the legitimacy of the rules that are embodied in that constitution. If a constitution lacks this legitimacy, then it's not really worth the paper that it is written on. And because of this legitimacy, constitutions exist to settle basic disputes. Because constitutions tell us something about authority, who has the authority to act and who does not. A constitution anticipates likely conflicts which might arise from the political institutions that it has created. But that's not all that constitutions do. They don't just set out those structures and then give us some rules about how those structures should work. They also often satisfy a kind of symbolic role they can be said to express the highest and most abstract aspirations of a political society. So you might see this in the preamble of a constitution. It sets out, this is what our political mission is as, as a country. 
and they encompass core principles of higher law. On top of this, many constitutions exist to entrench rights. Now, rights are, the way I would describe a right is it's an entitlement to act or an entitlement to be protected from action taken against you. Uh, and the discussion about rights has been extremely pervasive in modern Western political discourse. And it sort of experienced a resurgence after the Second World War. But really, discussion about rights, uh, you can find it throughout all of the early modern and modern uh, period of history. Um, and in particular, in liberal political thought, it is often said that there are certain fundamental rights, rights that people have by virtue of being a human being, rights that cannot be taken away from them by any institution or group of other people. But I think it's important to understand that the concept of rights is a particular historical product. In spite of high-flying notions about human rights, at the end of the day, we have to, it's human beings who decide what human rights are. You know, back in the early modern period, you could talk about natural rights, and you could say these are God-given rights, rights that, are, uh, that people have endowed to them by uh, a creator. But in modern political discourse, we tend to shy away from such theistic arguments. And so what's left in the secular vacuum is that it's really down to us as human beings. Now, who gets to decide what a right is and what might we think as fundamental human rights? So, you know, do people have a right to a job? Do people have a right to marry who they want to marry? Do they have a right to any type of political or religious practice? Do they have a right to a basic income? Do they have a right to a gun? Someone has to decide these things, and ultimately, the rights that we find in constitutions had to be put there. So I think it's important for us to understand the contextual and historical contingency of rights which we might find in certain constitutions. So let's take, for example, the right to bear arms, which you may have, Chris McLeod may have shared with you. I think it's an important one to revisit. So this is a right which is still found in the United States Constitution today, and it was put in the Constitution in 1791. And this amendment says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now at the time when this amendment was added to the Constitution in the Bill of Rights, uh, those who put it there thought it was a pretty fundamental uh, claim that any individual ought to be made, which is that they ought to be able to have a gun, they ought to be able to form a militia with people in their community to protect themselves. And ultimately, these, uh, but ultimately the people who put this in the Constitution uh, were reflecting the viewpoint of their own particular circumstance and time. And so, as Karl Bogus has put in his uh, piece, The Hidden History of the Second Amendment, he looks at who was pushing for the Second Amendment to be put in the Bill of Rights. And he finds that one of the major proponents of adding the Second Amendment to the Bill of Rights was southern states, which said this is a um, condition of their approval of the Constitution, that the right to bear arms is put in the Constitution. Now, why were they so insistent? Well, the types of people who were at the constitutional state conventions uh, in the late 18th century were all male, were all white, and in the South, most of them were slave owners. And they feared a majority. Their majority that they feared were in many parts of the South, in many southern counties, the enslaved populations were a majority of their county. The slave owners were certainly a minority of their county. And so the tyranny of the majority that they feared was the majority of the population who was enslaved African Americans. And they, as the elite minority, wanted this protection 
put in the Constitution. Now, when we look at this history now, we might then think this is a somewhat um, uh, dubious, to put it lightly, uh, rationale for declaring a fundamental right. And so I think that it's at least important for us to be cognizant of when we see rights in, in declarations of rights, even up to the modern day, we have to think about who wrote those declarations of rights, who put them in there, and what was the worldview that they reflected. So now I want to talk about the organizational structure of constitutions, because constitutions come in many forms. Should be, there we go. Um, the most common form is a single codified document. The, in, in a codified constitution, there is one document with amendments possibly added to it. But it's this set text from which all other political legitimacy is said to flow. Now, as I said, you can add amendments to this constitution, but typically in systems with codified constitutions, there is a supermajority requirement to change the constitution. It can't be a simple elected majority which changes the constitution. You might need extra buy-in. So in the United States, you need two-thirds of the elected members of the House of Representatives. You need two-thirds of uh, US senators. And then you need three-quarters of all of the US states to agree to an amendment to the US constitution. This is a very high barrier, one that is not very frequently met. Now, a second form of constitution is a sort of semi-codified constitution. Um, and this is one where there isn't a single set text. There isn't a single written document. Um, but there are certain laws, certain statutes, which are said to be entrenched. These are laws which are said to have a, a constitutional status and are given a status of higher law. So if you look at the Canadian Constitution, the uh, Constitution Act 1982 in Canada, specifies a list of 25 laws in Canada, which it says have the status of constitutional laws. And other laws that the Canadian Parliament might pass have to be measured against how consistent they are with those existing laws that are given that constitutional status. The third form of a constitution is the uncodified constitution. And this is a constitution where the, the constitution is not contained in a single document. Now, it's sometimes said that these are unwritten constitutions, but that's not entirely true, and I'll explain that a little bit more uh, later on. But these constitutions are a collection of uh, written laws, but also um, procedures, conventions, rules, and norms, which have been historically and traditionally understood to be the rules of the political game. Now, there may be statutes which have um, constitutional content to them. So in the British Constitution, uh, the Parliament Acts, which say that the House of Commons uh, should dominate the political system, that the House of Lords needs to defer to the House of Commons, although it can delay, or the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, which sets out the timing of the length of a parliamentary session. These are constitutional statutes, part of a written constitution, but unlike in the semi-codified system or in the codified system, these, con these uh, laws which have constitutional content can be easily repealed, as we've seen uh, this week, where a simple majority in Parliament was enough to change the Fixed Term Parliaments Act to bring in uh, an early election in December. So let's first look at a codified constitution, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of this? Well, one of the advantages of codified constitutions is they clearly state the goals and ideals of a country, so the preamble of the US Constitution sets out some of the kind of mission statement of the United States. It can act as a rule book, which litigants can sort of uh, 
refer back to in a very simplified way. It's easy for citizens to actually get access to their constitution. It's something that they can, they can read, something they can hold in their hand. There are copies, pocket copies of the US Constitution. I have one here, and you can carry it around and read it if you need some bedtime reading. Um, and so, in some ways, the Constitution is more accessible. It's something that everyone can get their hands on. You don't need uh, a law or politics degree to know what's in, the, what's in the US Constitution. It's there, easy for you to get access to. But there are some drawbacks to the US Constitution and the codified constitutional framework. And so one of the drawbacks is that it invests a huge amount of power in one generation against future generations. So the authors of codified constitutions, if they get what they want in that constitution, because the amendment procedure is so difficult, they're pretty, they can be pretty assured that most of what they put in that constitution is going to stay for a very long time. And indeed, the United States is still governed by uh, rules and procedures which were developed uh, in the late 18th century um, and uh, haven't been changed since. Now, some people might argue, look, the framers of the Constitution were very, very wise people. They were the leading lights of their uh, generation. And that, indeed, that might be the case, but it doesn't necessarily mean that what was wise and prudent in one generation ought to be wise and will be seen as wise and prudent in the next. There are just certain things that a framer of a constitution can't know, and there are certain values of society which change over time that might not have been reflected in the original writing of that constitution. And we can think about this in other ways. So, Leonardo da Vinci was, you know, a genius of his time, a leading light who designed uh, wonderful uh, blueprints of flying machines and had concepts of flight and so on, which were beyond uh, what really anyone else in the uh, Renaissance period was developing. But we wouldn't necessarily then say on that basis we would hire Leonardo da Vinci today to uh, build us a helicopter. Uh, similarly, Benjamin Franklin, who was one of the framers of the US Constitution and also a very wise man of his time, a, a scientist, uh, someone who developed the, um, pioneered the lightning rod and the safety around uh, electricity, saving many lives in his time by pr pr uh, protecting houses from lightning strikes. We wouldn't necessarily say just because he had that excellent expertise in the 18th century that we'd want him to wire this room or our house today. Now, some people might say, look, it's a bit different with politics than technology. Politics, there are certain values which stay throughout time, whereas technology does change a lot. And, and that, that, may be, uh, that may be so. But critics of the codified constitution say, no, values do change as well, and we shouldn't capture, uh, we shouldn't imprison populations today using the values and structures of the past. The American uh, writer and democratic theorist John Dewey said, you know, we would not require a man to wear the same coat that he wore as, as a boy. Um, a further concern is that codified constitutions may not actually be as clear as their defenders make out. You know, language might on the face of it seem quite plain and quite simple, but when applied to the realities and messiness of the world and of politics, it starts to become much less straightforward than it first met the eye. And then finally, another objection that's raised against codified constitutions is that they empower not elected uh, officials to make final calls on what's constitutional and what's not, but unelected experts, judges, to make those calls uh, as well. Now, in spite of those criticisms, I should say that there is a high degree of respect uh, and almost veneration 
for the US Constitution in the United States. Americans are not dissatisfied with their constitution if you ask them uh, about, about this document. Indeed, uh, a recent poll found that 92% of Americans agreed with the following statement, that the Constitution ensures liberty, the opportunity for economic prosperity, and a flourishing civil society for every American. Now, some commentators are critical of this veneration of the US Constitution. Daniel Lazar, in his book, The Frozen Republic, argues that the American people treat the Constitution in the same way that they would uh, treat uh, sort of Christian religion. So the Constitutional Convention of 1787, when the Constitution was written, is often treated as some kind of hallowed moment, some kind of uh, perfect birth of the country where um, there were um, only good and moral reasons for the actions of the people there. And that any departure any flaws in the United States are flaws because of the failure to keep true to the vision of the Philadelphia Convention of 1787. Those are the sinfulness of the American people. Uh, and so in some ways, the way that the Constitutional Convention is talked about is almost as if it was some kind of American Eden. The Constitution itself is often treated in the same way that some people approach uh, uh, holy texts, so there's a lot of attention put to reading the wording of the Constitution to try and work out what did the framers want us to do? How do we follow the, 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 the language of the Constitution so that we're faithful to what James Madison and Benjamin Franklin and George Washington wanted us to do? And then there's a kind of priesthood of the Constitution of the United States, where you get judges and academics and journalists and politicians who all claim to be the true interpreters of this text. Follow me. I'm the one who can tell you this is the way that we should live by. This is the way that we should govern ourselves. Now, the British Constitution doesn't have quite the same culture of veneration. Um, and it really, until recently, with recent events, I think most people in Britain were pretty nonplussed about the Constitution and wouldn't really be able to give you any sense of what it was if you even asked them. And one of the problems behind that, of course, is that the British Constitution is, is not codified. Now, as I said, it's not that it's unwritten. There are written elements to it, but there are also many unwritten elements to it. Now, the British Constitution, again, it doesn't have a singular document, but there are certain norms and conventions and core ideas which most people uh, living in British society would agree are core foundational concepts. Uh, and these were outlined uh, in the 19th century by a scholar called A.V. Dicey, the man at the top of the top picture, CPS sort of picture, um, and he said there are three core elements to the British Constitution. The sovereignty of Parliament, the rule of law, and then this guidance through constitutional convention and precedent. And of these three, Dicey said the sovereignty of Parliament is the most important. He said that Parliament has, quote, the right to make or unmake any law, whatever. And no person or body is recognized by the law as having the right to override or set aside the legislation of Parliament. In other words, Parliament can legislate as it chooses. No institution outside of Parliament can overturn acts of Parliament. There is no superior law or authority to say that this particular act runs against the Constitution of the United Kingdom. If Parliament says that it wants it to be law, then it is so. And Dicey said this is a fundamental logic of the British Constitution. The quite similarly looking uh, bearded man below Dicey is Walter Badgett. And Badgett, about 20 years before Dicey, wrote a very famous book, The English Constitution. There are lots of things in the English Constitution, but one of the things that I think you ought to know about the English Constitution is that Badgett distinguishes between what he calls the efficient Constitution and the dignified Constitution. 
So he says the British Constitution kind of runs in parallel. On one hand, you have these institutions that are of great symbolic significance. So the monarchy and the House of Lords and the established church and so on. But actually, they don't do a lot of the politicking. They are there more for the pageantry. They are the state side of the government. Whereas the kind of political side, the politics, gets done um, by sort of grubbier uh, political actors, the prime minister and the cabinet and members of the House of Commons. And Badgett says both are really important because it's important for the buy-in of the public to have that dignified constitution, to have certain institutions that people can sort of agree to and, and, and accept, while the actual kind of divisive element of government gets done at a slightly lower uh, level. Now, the UK system is what we would call a, a majoritarian system, a winner-take-all political system. Under the classic Westminster model, as it's sometimes called, um, there is no court which can overturn statute. The second chamber, the upper chamber, can't even kill off legislation. Uh, there is no uh, outside law which the government must contend with. And the former US ambassador to the United, to United Kingdom, Raymond Seitz, marveled at this British constitution compared to his own. He wrote, quote, coming to this kind of, coming from this kind of fractured and fragmented background, an American arrives on the shores of Britain, astonished to find uh, how unfettered a modern British government is. It took me a long time to understand uh, that a British government with a simple majority in the House of Commons can do pretty much what it wants to do. I kept looking for constitutional checks and institutional balances that could stay the will of the British government, but I could find none. So in one sense, this is a profoundly majoritarian democratic system. Once in power, the elected majority can govern without any formal restriction. And this can empower a government to do things that wouldn't necessarily be possible in other political systems. Even the foundation of the National Health Service, which was actually sort of a mass appropriation of, of private property in the form of nationalizing private hospitals, which have existed in this country for centuries. In many other political systems, those Hospitals would have had to be given statutory compensation. They could have sued the government and taken them to court, and then the, court, the legislation could have been found incompatible with some constitutional rights of private property and so on. Those checks don't exist in the system, and so they open up and widen the possibilities of, of politics. Parliament is at once a legislature, but also a kind of constantly sitting constitutional uh, convention. Now, how do we weigh up this system? Well, some people say there are real advantages to this system. Um, it's flexible, so it can adapt to uh, new uh, realities of politics. Um, it's pretty responsive to the democratic will. Um, it can operate pretty efficiently. You don't have to go through all these different checks and veto players and asking 33 different states what they think and so on. And some people also argue that there is a high degree of accountability. Uh, Tony Wright, the author of um, uh, a very short introduction to British politics, uh, said that in the British system, the government can only do as much as it can get away with. Now, for some people, this might look quite dangerous, but others would say there's always the threat of an election hanging over the neck of the government. Now, there are disadvantages to this system uh, as well. So, uh, Ian McLean, in his book, uh, What's Wrong with the British Constitution, 
declares that the British have what he calls a muddle-through mentality to their constitution. It's a make-up-as-you-go-along kind of constitution, a back-of-the-envelope politics, that no one really is sitting down and thinking seriously and systematically about how we should govern ourselves. It's just constant innovation and constant response to particular political questions and crises. And so it lacks a kind of rationalism which some political thinkers think is attractive. Also, unlike the US Constitution, which you can just hold in your hand, the British Constitution doesn't look like that. No one really knows all of the elements of the British Constitution. There is no single uh, delimited codified document in order to find out uh, what's in it, and that can cause some problems as well. That there are lots of constitutional conventions, which I'll show you in a minute, um, but it really takes a deg really degree of study to try and work out what all of those different conventions um, are. And then some people say this is a peculiar product of British history. It's not really a model that you can export anywhere else in the world. And it's because, unlike many other countries, the United Kingdom has never, in the, since the 18th century, has never had a uh, disruption of its politics in the same way. It's never had um, a fall to fascist dictatorship or uh, communist single party rule. Uh, it's never had a revolution. Um, it's never had um, a civil war since the uh, 18th century. Uh, and so, unlike other systems where uh, a country has had an opportunity to sit down and sort of start again, the British Constitution has, has never had that opportunity to sit down and start again. Some people argue that maybe it's time to do so, and other people uh, argue uh, against that. So, as I said, the British Constitution runs on this kind of, on these unwritten elements, these conventions that, that help it go along. And so this is not a comprehensive list, but these are some conventions that you, uh, most people would agree are part of the British Constitution. So uh, the monarch always agrees to legislation that Parliament passes. The Queen never vetoes anything. No monarch has vetoed any legislation since 1707. The monarch always asks the leader of the majority party in the House of Commons to form a government. And if there is no majority, then uh, the person most likely uh, to form a government is invited to form one. The queen always listens to the advice that her ministers give her. She's not constitutionally uh, really permitted to disagree with them. The prime minister must be an MP, uh, not a lord. This is a convention which was formed over the 20th century. Um, all ministers, all members of the executive branch of the government must also be members of the legislature. They must also be members of the House of Commons or members of the House of Lords. This is the opposite of the case in the United States, for example, whereas if you're in the executive branch, say a member of the cabinet, you are not allowed to simultaneously sit in the legislature in Congress. Uh, the British Constitution has the principle of collective uh, uh, cabinet responsibility. So whatever internal disagreements cabinet might have had in coming to a decision, once that decision is taken, then everyone in the cabinet is expected to abide by that decision or resign. Individual ministerial responsibility, which is slightly different, which is that as a government minister, you are responsible for the actions which take place in your department. And if something goes wrong in your department, then you as the political principal have to take responsibility for that, and that may include resigning. Even if it's not exactly your fault, even if it's a civil servant who makes a mistake, you as the political principal have to resign over that. We saw that uh, with, say, Amber Rudd over the uh, Windrush scandal. And then the Salisbury Convention, which is the convention that if a party puts policies in its manifesto and gets elected on that manifesto, then the House of Lords will respect the ability of that party to pass that legislation. Now, one of the other kind of problems with the British Constitution is that it's found it quite difficult to adapt to 
uh, the uh, EU membership. Because there are two constitutional principles which are in conflict. As we said, Dicey said the most important element of the British Constitution is parliamentary sovereignty. But a condition of EU membership is EU legal supremacy. So when a national law is found to be in conflict with EU law, then that national law um, is struck down in favor of that EU law. And that's, that's a new, that, you know, in the history of the British Constitution, that's been a new uh, development. For the first time, um, acts of parliament were found unconstitutional and struck down. And so one of these occurred in, uh, in 1991 um, over a case regarding uh, the Merchant Shipping Act of 1988. Uh, this was an act of parliament which was passed. It was taken to court because it was found to be incompatible with the um, common fisheries policy and various um, uh, treaty obligations to do with shipping. And the court struck down this law. This was a really uh, unusual happening in British constitutional practice. Um, and that's because the court found that actually the European Communities Act 1972 should have the status of higher law. And that's something, again, which is new to British parliamentary practice. This was reiterated again in, in the early 2000s in a case uh, called uh, Thoburn versus Sunderland City Council, uh, popularly known in the press as the Metric Martyrs case. There were a group of shopkeepers who wanted to list their produce only using um, old-style uh, measurements, pounds and ounces, rather than grams and kilograms. And this is incompatible with uh, EU law, that they have to show at least both metric and imperial, or just metric. Um, and the courts found that uh, this was an obligation that they had to... Uh, to follow. And Judge Bruce Morgan in this case explained why. He said, quote, in 1972, Parliament took a step which probably no British Parliament before has taken. The country quite voluntarily surrendered the once seemingly immortal concept of the sovereignty of Parliament and legislative freedom by membership of the European Union. In doing so, this must mean that we have a hierarchy of statute, a hierarchy dominated by the 1972 Act. The old adage where once there were two laws uh, that are incompatible, the later repeals the earlier, is no longer so. The 1972 Act was a bold pronouncement that a new source of law is henceforth recognized in this country. And so long as this country remains a member of the European Union, then the laws of this country are subject to the doctrine of the primacy of European community law. So this is something where some people now say that the British Constitution is a bit of a hybrid constitution, that it has the old elements in it, but also that there is some recognition of the higher law of the European Union. And so it may be in some ways the uh, UK Constitution has, is moving or has moved into that kind of semi-codified um, context. I just wanted to also just clarify the difference between uncodified and unwritten because I think it can be confusing and I think sometimes this language is used uh, imprecisely. So when we say a constitution is codified, we mean there is just one text, one text from which all other constitutional legitimacy flows. But actually, I would say that all constitutions, whether they're codified or uncodified, have both written and unwritten elements. So I've talked about how the uncodified British constitution has written elements, like the Parliament Act or the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. But the US Constitution, I would argue, also has uh, unwritten elements. And this is an argument which was made by the Yale Law uh, Professor Akil Amar. The US Constitution is really short, 7,500 words, shorter than undergraduate dissertation. And there are lots of elements to the US Constitution 
which aren't found actually in that writing. The document simply couldn't work if there weren't some unwritten elements to it. It just, we just wouldn't be able, the US just wouldn't be able to function. And so you have to rely on certain unwritten elements for this small document actually to, to work in the real world. So some of that is Supreme Court opinion. So the Supreme Court elaborates on how a constitution works and, and gives some further details and clarifications. Presidents have to interpret whether the uh, quite vague powers that they have in the Constitution um, it permit them to do a certain act or not. Uh, the US Constitution has plenty of practices and conventions. The US has a common law structure. Some of the readings of how we apply the Constitution in the United States rely on the degree of common sense interpretations and norms. So all of these things are quite like the unwritten elements in an uncodified constitution. And so I would clarify the difference between the two. So in fact, what I would say is that the difference between the US and the UK constitution is not so much written or unwritten, codified or uncodified, but it's actually the underlying theories of these constitutions. And I think that this is the key difference. The key difference is between what I call a political constitution and a legal constitution. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, a political constitution argues that nothing is beyond politics. To assert that some idea or claim like a right is beyond the ordinary basis of day-to-day -day politics is anathema to the political constitution. It argues that these claims to, to, to kind of set out some things as beyond politics, above politics, protected from democratic and majoritarian politics, is ultimately arbitrary. And it cloaks some ideas which are ultimately political in a false neutrality. So theoretically, in a political constitution, there are no legal restraints on what an elected government uh, can do. But in reality, of course, there are strong political constraints on what that government can do, whether that's most likely through uh, a no-confidence vote or through an election, for example. Those are where you find the checks on power. A legal constitution says, no, look, there are certain things which have to be protected from the majority. They have to be protected from the day-to-day -day, uh, exercise of power. And elected officials can't be trusted to govern well on their own. Now, there has to be some degree of benign expert over oversight into this. And this is where the courts come in. And the courts then can say, this is a legitimate decision, this is an illegitimate decision, this is constitutional, this is unconstitutional. So I think Chris McLeod has given you a good sense of the, of the legal constitutional model, uh, often described as a kind of a liberal constitutional model. I just want to talk through in the remaining minutes about the theory of the political constitution, which is often said to describe the British constitutional order. And the classic articulation of the political constitution was made by the Welsh academic J.G. Griffith, uh, who spent a lot of time at LSE. Um, and he argued, well, in his Chorley lecture, The Political Constitution, he attacked the idea of bills of rights. He said, um, bills of rights uh, create limits on a legislature which are seen to be judicially enforceable. But according to Griffith, there is no such thing as rights um, in an objective sense. There are just political claims. And politics at its root is a struggle between the rulers and the ruled about the size, shape, and scope of those claims. For Griffith, the law is not separate from or superior to ordinary democratic politics. So according to Griffith, although the framers of bills of rights might be ingenious in crafting abstract formulations of rights, that should not endow them with supernatural powers. These formulations simply conceal political claims. And ultimately, any codification of rights transfers adjudication for what are ultimately political claims out of the hands 
of elected officials and elected electorates and into the hands of unelected judges. Another advocate of the political constitution is the Glasgow University uh, academic uh, and MSP, Adam Tompkins. Tompkins argues that political constitutions like the British constitution are actually quite radical because they place the electorate at the center rather than placing judges above them. The key value, Tompkins argues, of a political constitution is accountability. In this system, it is easy to hold decision makers to account by the public. Um, and that's because you have uh, ideas like collective cabinet responsibility and individual ministerial responsibility, which are meant to provide the public with the clearest sense of who is responsible for a given uh, decision. And the key theory, the key concept that Tompkins relies on is this idea of non-domination, that the people must be free to rule themselves and must be trusted to do so. Oops. And in this vein, another scholar of the political constitution, Richard Bellamy at UCL, um, argues that a political constitution is a democratic constitution. It's a constitution of the masses. A legal constitution, a liberal constitution, is a constitution which is suspicious of, of the majority, suspicious of the masses. Under a political constitution, the political process itself is the functioning of the constitution. And that constitution then is sustained, not undermined, by majoritarian day-to-day -day democratic politics. This means that the Constitution is very flexible. It's very unstable. It can be challenged, changed, revised, almost at a drop of a hat. But Bellamy says this is a good thing. He says it means that the Constitution is close to the public's grasp through their elected representatives. And for Bellamy, no political matter then should be decided by actors who cannot be held directly accountable by voters uh, at an election. For Bellamy, law is about what the majority wants. It's not about whether it's just or unjust. It's not about whether it's right or false, true or untrue. It's about whether or not the majority uh, voted for it to happen. So, if we were to look at these two values systems, these theories of constitutions, I think that ultimately this comes down to a matter of trust. It is impossible to take decision, political decisions and fully make them apolitical. But I think it is correct to say that law is just politics by another, game, another name. So then the question is, who do you trust to make those political decisions? Do you think that the majority should be trusted to make those decisions? Or do you think that there are risks and dangers in giving the majority that power? That it should be down to enlightened experts to temper the majority, to make decisions on their behalf, maybe with view to some minority? And when we think about minorities, we shouldn't just think about minorities as oppressed people. Minorities can also be very privileged people. Privileged elites are also minorities. The slaveholders were minorities in the South in the late 18th century. But I'll leave that for you to decide. And um, this here is a list of further reading. And I just wanted to clarify before you go that on Moodle now, there should be a link on the main page for a resource list. And if you go onto that resource list, uh, you can click through, and there are lots of extra readings now uh, that correspond to the readings in the printed handbook. And many of these readings have been uploaded on the internet for you to capture electronically. Some of them have been scanned for you. Um, so this would be very helpful for when you write your essays, if you choose to write your essay, say, on the Constitution topic. So I'll leave it here for now, and I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>